All right, you may be seated. Good morning, jurors. Thank you so much for your patience. All right, next witness. Jeremy Call, PJ Pesch. Do you swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Thank you. Good morning, sir. And you please tell the jury your full name. Uh, it's Paul Peter Pesch, Jr., but uh, I've always been referred to as P.J. Pesch. Mr. Pesh, what do you do for a living? Uh, I direct and write movies and television. How long have you been in the business of directing and writing movies and television? Uh, 35 years. Can you give the jury a background on your uh, movies that you've directed and kind of a biographical sketch? Sure. Uh, I attended Columbia University uh, and studied under Martin Scorsese and did a short film that traveled around the world. I wound up getting a deal at Paramount in 1990. Um, I directed a film for Roger Corman in 1991 that I wrote and directed. In 1995, I directed a Western with Sam Elliott that we actually shot at Bonanza Creek Ranch. Um, that was a also rather lower budgeted short schedule. Uh, I've directed six feature films and close to 100 hours of television. Um, I've created television shows, um, written and sold movie scripts. Um, I've worked for Paramount, uh, Warner Brothers, HBO, Universal, Fox. Anything else? I that, that's um, a really good background, and I, I just want to ask you with regard uh, to the western on Bonanza Creek. That's also the site of, of where Rust was found. Is that right? That's what I understand. Yeah. Well, Mr. Pesh, um, it sounds like you have experience also with uh, movies involving firearms. Yes. Um, many of the television shows and I think four or five of the six films, two of them were westerns. Uh, one of them was one of the Sniper series with Tom Berenger. Uh, one of them was uh, Smoke and Aces, which had a considerable amount of gunfire. In your uh, work on the movies involving uh, gunfire, have you had the occasion to work with armors and prop masters? I have. And actually, in all of the movies you've done, I'm sure I'm certain you've worked with prop masters. Yes. Okay, sir. And, and with regard to those movies that you've directed in television, have you worked with uh, directors, first assistant directors, and understood people's roles on the set? I have. Okay. With regard to armors, have you ever worked on a prior film in which an armor had split duties as an armor and a props? I have not. With regard to uh, this situation where there is a uh, gun heavy set I will represent to you. Would you think, in your experience and what you've seen, it would be advisable to have a part-time armorer doing two jobs? I would say that would be highly inadvisable. Whose responsibility is it to properly staff with regard to the movie functions? Uh, the line producer or the, u the unit production manager. When you have a set involving upwards of 20 firearms, would it be, in your experience, possible for a part-time armorer to manage that? I wouldn't imagine so. Um, 
one person can each one of those weapons needs to be tracked pretty consistently for the set to remain safe so I don't see how a single person can keep their eye on 20 firearms. With regard to overall set safety and your experience and background, who is in charge of that? The first AD is considered in all of the published safety advisories uh, the chief safety officer on the set. Are you a member of various guilds? I'm a member of the Writers Guild, the Directors Guild, SAG-AFTRA, which is the Actors Guild, and I also happen to be a member of the Musicians Guild. Okay, so when you talk about safety rules, uh, are some of those from those guilds? Yes, there's a, I can't remember the name of the organization, but they sort of uh, collectively represent all of the various guilds and issue recommendations for safety uh, that they recommend uh, attaching to the call sheet each day. Is it, in your experience, also um, something you've seen where there will be daily safety meetings on set, especially in a gun-heavy set? Expert? Expert? Uh, yes, Your Honor. We, I believe he can give lay opinions on his experience, but, but also we would tender him as an expert. I, I think we should approach. So, Mr. Pesch, you were discussing some of those safety rules now. Would it be, in your experience, advisable for uh, production to convene daily safety meetings? Yes, in fact, it's recommended by all of the published literature uh, by the guilds. Um, and it's been my, they, they recommend that a safety meeting takes place anytime uh, there's to be any stunts, firearms, special effects, but it's been my experience but in the last seven or eight years since the tragic incident with the camera assistant who was killed on the railroad bridge that every first AD I've worked with, regardless of what's happening that day on the call sheet, has a quick safety meeting just running over and reiterating basic safe practices and and you as a uh, director uh, is that something that you advise and you practice I don't give safety meetings that's the job of the safety officer the first AD but I think it's a great idea in your experience and in, in interacting with first assistant directors if for example there's a situation where a set is rushing, there's safety issues occurring, does the first assistant director have any responsibility in that respect? Most definitely. And what would that be in your experience? What would, what would you expect to see happen? Um, my experience has been that the first has an announcement to everybody, slow down, this is not safe, or we're not doing this, or just takes charge and uh, if there's a specific issue with a crew member they'll pull them aside and discuss the issue and consult with stunts or props or uh, firearms and deal with it. Is that also true, for example, if you have an issue with an actor? Uh, for example, uh, firing a blank after somebody yells cut, 
What would the first AD be expected to do in your experience? Uh, speak with them and indicate. Look, when cut is called, uh, usually the only person that can call cut is the director. But if, if it's a safety issue, anybody can call cut. And once cut is called, everything needs to stop. Because if there is a safety issue, obviously, that somebody's noticed, nothing else should take place. So, yes, the first AD should speak to that performer. When it comes to safety, what is your view as to everybody's responsibility and so? Well, again, it's not just my view, but again, in the published literature of the, of the various guilds, they indicate safety is everyone's responsibility. If there's a safety issue, there are anonymous hotlines for anybody to call and raise these issues. And are those uh, anonymous hotlines, are those published generally in your experience working on set? They are. Usually they're uh, with that safety recommendations that are attached to the call sheet. And those hotlines, uh, what do they, what did they provide for people to be able to do if they notice a safety failure? Uh, you can call the someone from your guild. Uh, each of the studios has their own separate hotline. Um, uh, and as far as I know, that will allow you to anonymously, so you don't look. If you report something, you could put your career in jeopardy. Nobody wants to do that, but um, the idea is that a representative can provide that information to somebody who will take action, such as the producer, the UPM, or the first AD. In your experience, uh, have you worked and seen the interaction between prop masters and armors? I have. And can you tell the jury, in your experience generally, how they interact, uh, who's in charge of the firearms and who's in charge of the ammunition, and then what the prop master role is? Well, the prop master, more often than not, hires the armorer because that's a subset of that department. But the armorer is in charge of all ammunition, all firearms, um, maintaining them, uh, keeping them safe, and inventorying the ammunition. With those duties and responsibilities, would you believe it be to be important in your experience to accord the armorer adequate time to do those duties? Yes. And would it be important to accord adequate resources uh, for that armor to do those duties. Yes. If there is a scenario where the um, armor is dealing with uh, a gun heavy set, not having those resources, who would you expect to assist that, that armor in getting those? Props. If there is a situation where um, there is a scene, a video, something's happening, and both the armor and first assistant director witness a uh, safety violation involving a, a weapon, for example, um, what would be your assessment whether one or both of them um, should say something about that? I would say both of them should say something about it and figure out why it happened and uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Cross exam. Mr. Pesch, I just have a couple follow up questions for you. Thank you for your time today. Certainly. Um, 
So anyone on the crew can stop filming due to safety concerns, is that right? That's right. And that includes Ms. Gutierrez? That's correct. Um, and, sir, did you read or watch the statements of Ms. Gutierrez in preparation for your testimony? I did not. That was my understanding. Um, so, are you aware that on October 21st, 2021, um, Ms. Gutierrez was not inside the church with the gun, not because she was working on props, but because she was just doing some other armor duties? Objection, Your Honor. Do I need to restate the question? Do you yes. remember? Yes, okay. please. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, we, we saw some, some uh, interviews from Ms. Gutierrez, and, and she does uh, explain that she was not in the church because she was um, preparing her fanny pack and her blank ammunition for the next scene. You agree that that sounds like armor work to, to, to you, not props work? Yes. Okay. Um, and are you also aware, sir, that on the morning of the 21st, when the crew was waiting for replacement camera personnel to arrive, Ms. Gutierrez had approximately three hours uh, to work on her preparation for the scenes that day? I was not aware of that. Okay, thank you. I'll pass the witness. Any redirect? Uh, just uh, very briefly, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Patch, if there was um, a scene going on inside the church at that time involving Mr. Baldwin and the firearm. If Ms. Gutierrez Reed was not in the church, would you have expected someone to have called her back in? I would. If there's a firearm on set, there should be an armor on set. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right, thank you. You're excused. Thank, thank you. you. Council approach. Next witness. At this time, the defense rests. Okay, thank you. All right, so both sides have rested. It's now my duty to give you the instructions of law. I'm going to read them to you, and then you will get a copy of the instructions, okay? The instructions I'm giving you are very helpful for the um, counsel to uh, use in their closing arguments, okay, which will follow. All right, so instruction number one. You have heard all the evidence. It is now my duty to tell you the law that you must follow in this case. Instruction number two. 
The law governing this case is contained in instructions that I am about to give you. It is your duty to follow the law as contained in these instructions. You must consider these instructions as a whole. You must not pick out one instruction or parts of an instruction and disregard others. A copy of these instructions will be given to you when you begin your deliberations. Instruction number three. The law presumes the defendant to be innocent unless and until you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of her guilt, his or her guilt. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It is not required that the state prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. The test is one of reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense, the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act in the graver and more important affairs of life. Instruction number four. You are the sole judges of the facts in this case. It is your duty to determine the facts from the evidence produced here in court. Your verdict should not be based on speculation, guess, or conjecture. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence your verdict. You are to apply the law as stated in these instructions to the facts as you find them, and in this way decide the case. Instruction number five. Your verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror. In order to return a verdict, it is necessary that each juror agrees. Your verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty to consult with one another and try to reach an agreement. However, you are not required to give up your individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but you must do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your own view and change your opinion if you are convinced it is erroneous. But do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight or effect of evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the purpose of reaching a jur uh, verdict. You are the judges, judges of the facts. Your sole interest is to ascertain the truth from the evidence in this case. Instruction number six, each crime charged in the information should be considered separately. Instruction number seven, you must not concern yourself with the consequences of your verdict. Instruction number eight, you must not draw any inference of guilt from the fact that the defendant did not testify in this case, nor should this fact be discussed by you or enter into your deliberations in any way. Instruction number nine, you alone are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight to be given to the testimony of each of them. In determining the credit to be given any witness, you should take into account the witness's truthfulness or untruthfulness, ability and opportunity to observe, memory, manner while testifying, any interest, bias, or prejudice the witness may have, and the reasonableness of the witness's testimony considered in light of all of the evidence in the case. Instruction number 10. You should consider each opinion received in evidence in this case and give it such weight you think it deserves. If you should conclude that the reason given in support of the opinion, the reasons given in support of the opinion are not sound, or that for any other reason an opinion is not correct, you may disregard the opinion entirely. Instruction number 11. An expert witness is a witness who, by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education, has become expert in any subject. An expert witness may be permitted to state an opinion as to that subject. You should consider each expert opinion and the reasons stated for the opinion, giving them such weight as you think they deserve. You may reject an opinion entirely if you conclude that it is unsound. Instruction number 12. For you to find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one, the state must prove to your satisfaction, beyond a reasonable doubt, each of the following elements of the crime. One, Hannah Gutierrez endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. Two, Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by Hannah Gutierrez's actions. Action. Three, Hannah Gutierrez acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others. Four, Hannah Gutierrez's act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. 
5. This happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October 2021. Instruction 12A. For you to find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter in count 1, alternative, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. 1. Hannah Gutierrez loaded live ammunition into a firearm intended to contain only inert ammunition and or Hannah Gutierrez failed to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition she loaded into the firearm. 2. Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by Hannah Gutierrez's action. 3. Hannah Gutierrez acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others. 4. Hannah Gutierrez's act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. 5. This happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October 2021. Instruction number 13. For you to, define, for you to find the defendant guilty of neg negligent use of a deadly weapon as a lesser included offense charged in count 1, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. 1. The defendant endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. 2. This happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October 2021. Instruction number 13A. For you to find the defendant acted negligently in this case, you must find that the defendant acted with willful disregard of the rights or safety of others and in a manner which endangered any person or property. Instruction 13b. In addition to the other elements of tampering with evidence, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant acted intentionally when she committed the crime. A person acts intentionally when she purposely does an act which the law declares to be a crime. Whether the defendant acted intentionally may be inferred from all of the surrounding circumstances, such as the manner in which she acts, the means used, or her conduct. Instruction number 14. You have been instructed on the crimes of involuntary manslaughter and the lesser included offense of negligent use of a firearm as charged in count one. It is up to you, the jury, to choose the manner and order in which you deliberate on the crimes charged in that count. However, to return a verdict, you must follow the procedure described in the next instruction. Instruction number 15. To aid you in your deliberations and in returning your verdict, you will be provided both guilty and not guilty forms for each of the charges for each of the crimes charged in count one. Unless you unanimously agree on a verdict, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime. Although you may deliberate on the crimes charged in count one in any manner and order which you choose, you must return your verdicts for each offense in count one in the order they are instructed. Under this procedure, if you unanimously find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you should sign the guilty form for that offense and should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining offense in count one. If after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on involuntary manslaughter, you should not sign a verdict form for that offense and should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining offense. You should only return a verdict on negligent use of a firearm if you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you must sign the not guilty verdict form for involuntary manslaughter before returning a verdict on any other crime charged in count one. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of negligent use of a firearm, you should sign the guilty verdict for that offense. If you do not reach a unanimous verdict on negligent use of a firearm, you should not sign a verdict form for that offense. Instruction number 16. In this case, as to the charge of involuntary manslaughter contained in count one, there are four possible verdicts. One, guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Two, not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Three, guilty of negligent use of a firearm. Four, not guilty of negligent use of a firearm. You must consider each of these crimes. You should be sure that you fully understand the elements of each crime before you deliberate further. 
You have the discretion to choose the manner and order in which you deliberate on this count, but you must return a unanimous verdict of not guilty on involuntary manslaughter before entering a verdict on negligent use of a firearm. You will first decide whether the defendant is guilty of the crime of involuntary manslaughter. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then that is the only form of verdict which is to be signed as to this count. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then you should sign only the not guilty form as to involuntary manslaughter. If, after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on involuntary manslaughter, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime, and you should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining crime. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you will then go on to a consideration of the crime of negligent use of a firearm. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of negligent use of a firearm, then that is the only form of verdict which should be signed. But if you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of the crime of negligent use of a firearm, then you should sign only the not guilty form. If, after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on negligent use of a firearm, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime. You may not find the defendant guilty of more than one of the foregoing crimes. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the defendant has committed any one of the crimes, you must determine that the defendant is not guilty of that crime. If you find the defendant not guilty of all of these crimes in count one, you must return a verdict of not guilty as to this count. Instruction number 17. For you to find the defendant guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in count two, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, the defendant Hannah Gutierrez had a baggie of cocaine by asking Rebecca Smith to take it outside of Hannah Gutierrez's hotel or hid a baggie of cocaine by asking Rebecca Smith to take it outside of Hannah Gutierrez's hotel room. Two, by doing so, the defendant intended to prevent the apprehension, prosecution, or conviction of Hannah Gutierrez for the crime of involuntary manslaughter. Three, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October, 2021. Instruction number 18. A firearm means any weapon which will or is designed to or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the actions of an explosion. The frame or receiver of a firearm, any firearm muffler or firearm silencer. Firearm includes any handgun, rifle, or shotgun. Instruction number 19. In addition to the other elements of the crime of involuntary manslaughter as set, in for, as set forth in instruction number 12a, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt, doubt that, one, the death was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez placing a live round into a firearm intended to contain only inert ammunition and or Hannah Gutierrez's failure to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition she loaded into the firearm. Two, the act of the defendant was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. The defendant's act was a significant cause of death if it was an act which, in a natural and continuous chain of events, uninterrupted by an outside events, resulted in the death and without which the death would have not occurred. There may be more than one significant cause of death. If the acts of two or more persons significantly contribute to the cause of death, each act is a significant cause of death. Instruction number 20. The state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's act was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. An issue in this case is whether the negligence of a person other than the defendant may have contributed to the cause of death. Such contributing negligence does not relieve the defendant of responsibility for an act that significantly contributed to the cause of death so long as the death was a foreseeable result of the defendant's actions. However, if you find the negligence of a person other than the defendant was the only significant cause of death or constitutes an intervening cause that breaks the foreseeable chain of events, then the defendant is not guilty of the offense of involuntary manslaughter. Instruction number 21. 
Now the lawyers will argue the case. What is said in, in the closing arguments is not evidence. It is an opportunity for the lawyers to discuss the evidence and the law as I have instructed you. The state has the right to argue first, the defense may then argue, and the state may then reply. Counsel? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May it please the court, counsel. Um, I want to begin by thanking you all for your time. I know that this has been a, a long trial, and um, I also understand that as jurors, you find yourselves maybe a little frustrated. There's a lot of sitting around and waiting. Um, and uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate the sacrifice that you make when you leave your jobs and your families and your other responsibilities and you come to court uh, to participate in a very, very important part of our justice system. So on behalf of the state of New Mexico, uh, we thank you very much for your time. And as you can see, willful and foreseeable. And please keep in mind that omissions can also be willful. So when we fail to do something that we should do, and that failure uh, results in someone's death, that too uh, can be useful. So I ask that you keep that in mind as we move to some of evidence and testimony that you have heard. I know you have heard a lot, and I do not intend to keep you too long, uh, but I do have to be thorough. I do want to hit uh, some high points. So I do appreciate your patience. Um, here's what we saw. These videos, if you recall, that were taken by production outfitters, they were taken on October 13th of 2021. What these demonstrate to you is that Ms. Gutierrez was unwilling to maintain proper firearm safety repeatedly. And it's really important because this is not a case where Hannah Gutierrez made one mistake and that one mistake was accidentally putting a live round into that gun. That's not what this case is about. This case is about constant, never-ending safety failures that resulted in the death of a human being and nearly killed another. So let's talk about all of the safety failures that we saw, and the reason that these safety failures prior to October 21st are so critically important to the analysis is because they go to foreseeability. And foreseeability is a very important element in this case. So as we can see here, we have our um, stunt man, with his double barrel shotgun. From watching those videos, what you understood is that Ms. Gutierrez did appear to, in fact, be present because at times we saw her and at times we heard her. So she wasn't off doing prop duties. 
She was right there, and she never intervened. Gun pointed at a child. Gun pointed at Joel Souza directly at his back. Gun pointed up in the air in the direction of the stunt coordinator. Gun pointed again, apparently in the direction of Mr. Souza, the person on the far right. Gun pointed directly at Mr. Souza again, the firearm in the left hand of the stuntman who is facing you. Firearm pointed directly at a minor child. Firearm pointed directly at the camera. Ms. Gutierrez holding that same firearm with the muzzle pointed at her own face. Um, this was unexpected. Ms. Gutierrez stood by and did nothing in between scenes when that stuntman, who had certainly been sent the message that he could do whatever he wanted with those guns, no one was going to intervene. The person tasked with intervening was not going to do it. That was clear. He hands the firearm to the child and allows the child to manipulate the gun before then, after a short period of time, perhaps thinking better of it and taking the gun back. This firearm, I actually don't think in this photo that the firearm is pointed at the child. I think the firearm is based on the angle of the camera, probably more pointed at this person right here. Um, but she's there. We hear her, we see her, she does nothing. Absolutely nothing. This is some of the first evidence that we see where if something doesn't stop, if something doesn't change, she is moving in, in the direction of potentially a fatal incident, and that is exactly what happened. And I want you to recall Ms. Gutierrez's interview on November 9th when Ms. Gutierrez uh, spoke of the accidental discharge with the other stuntman. Um, having a complete lack of understanding of her role in safety on this movie set, she's talking about Sarah Zachary, and she was like, well, yours just went off in there after you loaded it. And I said, yeah, well, I can't be responsible for every dickhead fucking stunt guy that gets a hold of the gun and doesn't understand the concept that it's hot. Her entire job is to be responsible for exactly that. And when she took this job, she agreed to that responsibility. There is no exception in the law for your young. The exception in the law does not exist. The law treats everyone the same, and it must. What was the point to the testimony about the lever action rifle? Well, here's the point to the testimony about the lever action rifle. More negligence, more carelessness, more lack of attention to safety. She loaded a lever action rifle with dummy rounds that by the way, according to the director, was completely unnecessary. Because yes, while it's true, this gun operates in a way where if a certain type of camera angle is hitting it, 
dummy rounds would be appropriate if the scene calls for loading or cycling. There wasn't a scene that called for that. So she just loaded a lever action rifle with dummy rounds and surprisingly put the wrong caliber round in the gun. That is absolutely an example of someone who is not paying attention, not taking their job seriously. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the rounds that you've seen because it's critical to tracking the existence of the live rounds on this movie set. And we have spent a lot of time and effort tracking those rounds around that movie set. And we're gonna show you that evidence right now. So the important thing to know is that the Seth Kenny dummies, which you are looking at right here, are patinaed. They are distinct. They have an antique coloring. They also have silver primers. These rounds did not come on that movie set until October 12th of 2021 because Mr. Kenny didn't have them. And if you recall his testimony, he was in Texas. So he had to get back, clean them up, and provide them to Sarah Zachary. And that took place on October 12th. This is just simply the primer side of those rounds. You can see that they're dark in color on the primer side, and they do appear to have silver primers. This is a photograph of the 3840 dummies. If you recall Mr. Kenny's testimony, the 3840 dummies came from Billy Ray. And the important thing about this photograph is that none of those dummy rounds had silver primers. And silver primer is a very important piece of this puzzle. This is those same rounds on their side. You can see that they are shiny brass. We also know that they have brass primers. We just saw that. Uh, based on Mr. Kenny's testimony, you know that they were 3840, but there was also some 4440 caliber rounds um, in that box. Does that matter? They're not working. Well, let's stop. Okay. Um, let's take a moment to talk about all this testimony that you've heard about whether or not the live rounds found at PDQ, which are photographed there on the left, match the live rounds found on the set of Rust. You don't have to be a gun expert to look at those and see they simply do not match. Even though you could look at those rounds and fundamentally understand that they are not the same, the police department, sorry, the sheriff's department sent them to the FBI for testing so that we could actually have some experts confirm what we can see with our very own eyes. And what you have in evidence, if you want to see them in, in real time, you have States Exhibit 79, you have States Exhibit 91. States Exhibit 79 is a disassembled live round from PDQ Props. States Exhibit 79 is a disassembled live round from the set of Rust. You can look at them, you can see the projectiles are different, you can see that uh, it, perhaps the primers are even, are, are even different, if you recall. Uh, Ms. Popple indicated there were only 10 silver primered live rounds found at PDQ. The rest of them were brass. The other thing that you can just see with your eyes is the gunpowder in these is substantially different. It has a different chemical composition. So any argument 
that could ever be made in this case, that Seth Kinney was the source of these live rounds, is absolutely dishonest. Now, I'm going to ask you to take a, take a walk in the weeds with me here, okay? This is a photograph of October 10th of 2021. You can see the color of the rounds at the top. Those are brass primered rounds. The rounds in the bottom appear to be lighter, and I would suggest to you, based on the totality of the evidence that we're gonna go through, that you are looking at live rounds. And keep in mind, anything that you see on the set of this movie that is a revolver ammunition, that is revolver ammunition prior to October 12th, if it has a silver primer, it's a live round because the silver primered dummies didn't come on set for two days after this photograph was taken. Here's our comparison photo that Mr. Primo put together for us. And if you need it when you're reviewing the evidence and doing your deliberations, or engaging in your deliberations, I have included it for you, um, but we're gonna do a comparison here in a moment. Now, the importance of this photograph, still October 10th of 2021, there, are, there appears to be revolver ammunition in the background there at the top. Two of those have silver primers. The problem with that is the silver primer dummies weren't there yet. But the live rounds were. And there's your close up. It's absolutely undeniable. Is it blurry? Yes. Can you clearly see the difference? Absolutely. All of these photos that you're looking at were October 10th. Now, Let's move to October 13th of 2021. I invite you to look at that photograph carefully and ask yourselves, which of these is not like the others? It's the third one from the left. Look at the shape of that projectile and look at the color of the brass. So on October 13th, Mr. Kenny's dummies have arrived on set. They are the only dummy rounds with silver primers, but they are patinaed in color. So when you look at this round, it appears to be a spot on match for the live rounds, but unfortunately we can't see the primer in this photo so we can't tell if this is a brass primered dummy. That's the reason that we watched thousands of videos and looked at thousands of pictures because then we moved to the production outfitter videos from October 13th, the same day. And we're looking at that same gun holster that was provided to Mr. Baldwin. And there you see it. The third one down has a silver primer. And now you know it is a live round. You know that because it's not a Seth Kinney dummy. If it were, it wouldn't have that shiny brass color. So there's your live round. We've seen it on October 10th. We've seen it on October 13th. And there's absolutely no way that the lighting is playing tricks on our eyes when we're looking at these enhanced photos because you see it frame after frame after frame. 
And now let's move to October 15th. Karen Kuhn arrives on set. I think she was probably there long before the 15th. She is taking photos. She took approximately, as she testified, 9,000 photos. So on the 15th, there it is. There's your silver primer. It's just been moved to a different location in the holster because they're pulling dummy rounds from here, there, and everywhere and putting them in belts and putting them in guns and do, you know doing whatever they want to do. But there it is. It's right there on October 15th. And if you think I'm stretching it, Let's have a look at what we've got here. This is the gun belt that was assigned to actor Jensen Ackles. Because his gun belt was not a shoulder holster, we weren't able to find any photos or videos of it in the thousands and thousands and thousands that we reviewed because they're always covered by his coat. There is the evidence photo of the Baldwin holster on October 21st when it is taken into evidence. You have a Seth Kinney dummy at the top. You have what the FBI determined to be a live round in the second spot. And then you've got three brass primered dummies. October 17th, October 21st. So the video that Mamie Mitchell laid the foundation for. She said, she said that according to her notes, the filming was done on the 17th. Mr. Primo said that he believed according to the camera, it was the 18th. Take whatever date, whatever date you want. That's a match. Seth Kinney dummy at the top, live round next. You've got three brass primer dummies on the 21st, four brass primer dummies on the 17th or 18th. But it is shockingly the same. And there is no question that this one right here was a live round. It was sent to the FBI and they confirmed it. This is Ms. Gutierrez talking about um, her bringing these dummy rounds on set. I had a multitude of the ones with holes and the ones that you shake, so yeah. And I checked those all and I put them into two things. And then we start talking about boxes. Obviously when she says things, she's talking about boxes. They usually had JS on them. This is one my dad sent me, and mine are usually beat up pretty bad, like they're very dirty and gross. She's talking about the box and the styrofoam insert. The box and the styrofoam insert, she's saying, are dirty. Hers, the ones that she brings on set, are dirty. They're not new and clean like some of the other ones. Detective Hancock asks her, this is the one that was or handed that you guys had said that you had pulled from. This is that moment in that interview where Ms. Gutierrez has already shown Hancock the photo from her dad and an hour or two later, Detective Hancock decides that now is the time to show her the photo of the box of dummies she was pulling from that day, and it won't surprise you to learn they're a spot-on match. You have the styrofoam insert from that box of dummies here in evidence, and the reason that we gave it to you so that you can actually look at it in real time and not look at a photograph is because it's kind of dirty and gross. It kind of fits 
exactly the way that she described it. But there are some characteristics of this styrofoam insert that are going to become more important. Any, any suggestion by the defense that somehow the box of dummy rounds that Ms. Gutierrez said she was pulling from was swapped out with something different uh, is absolute nonsense. First of all, you know that because you can see the live rounds. If you don't think you can see them on the 10th and you don't think you can see them on the 13th and you don't think you can see them on the 15th, you know you're looking at one on the 17th and 18th. You know you are. So where's, where does the sabotage theory go then? The 17th and 18th, the camera crew hadn't quit yet. Mr. Norvell wasn't on set poking around on the, uh, on the prop cart. Mr. Halls hadn't had an opportunity to, to spend any time with the gun. They moved directly from that cart right into Lieutenant Benavides's patrol unit. They go from that patrol unit right into evidence at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department. And on November 9th of 2021, Hannah Gutierrez shows Detective Hancock, now Corporal Hancock, the box of dummies that she and her dad have. And if you listen to Mr. Kenny's testimony, what you understand is that the ammunition from the previous set, that being the old way, Hannah brought leftover dummies from that movie onto the set of Rust, and those 45 long Colt dummy rounds were provided by Thel Reed. What you are looking at in this photo is this styrofoam insert. This is the styrofoam insert that had the live round in it. This is the styrofoam insert that came out of the box labeled 45 long Colt dummies with the JS in the middle. Now, let's put it together. Our original evidence photo up here from October 10th, you can see this distinct uh, sort of cut in the styrofoam on that insert that is sitting on her leg on the 10th. You can see that the hole in the styrofoam in the second to the right at the top is dirty. You can see a little bit of grime you can see it right there, and you're going to take it into evidence, and you can look at it closer. You're going to see that there's some damage to the styrofoam separators between these two holes. And what do you know? It's right there. There's a little bit of damage to the styrofoam separators down here. You can see it in the photo on the right. You can look for yourself. It is right here. And what do you know? That silver primered round from October 10th is sitting in the exact same position that it was found on October 21st when the Sheriff's Department collected this box, took it into evidence, and photographed it. Ladies and gentlemen, we call that circumstantial evidence but that's a mountain of circumstantial evidence. Prop assistant duties versus armor duties on October 21st of 2021. Let's focus on that day. And listen, I'm not here to tell you that Rust Productions did the right thing when they hired on a part-time armorer and asked her to also spend her time doing props. I think everybody who has testified has said that was a really bad idea. 
And that's probably part of the reason that they're being sued by a whole bunch of different people. But on October 21st, this was simply not the case. It was not the case on that day. She had three hours in the morning waiting for the camera crew to arrive. She had every opportunity to go through that box of dummies, gee, that only had like 30 rounds in it. How long does it take to pull the round out of the box, shake it, and if it doesn't shake, look to see if it has a hole in it, put it back in the box, and do that to each and every one of them. How long does that exercise take? 10 minutes max? That's not hard. The other thing that is very important is Ms. Gutierrez didn't get pulled out of the church because she had to go focus on prop duties. She left the gun in the church contrary to all the industry standards uh, for armors on movie sets, for firearm safety on movie sets, and she went back out to her cart so that she could start doing other armor duties. She's getting her fanny pack filled up. Well, we've seen that. She's filling it with blanks. And we know they're about to do a turnaround. They're going to do this, this, uh, quick, this quick insert with Baldwin, and then they're going to do the shoot scene, the, the, the gunfire scene where they're using blanks, and the law enforcement have come into the church, and there's a shootout. So she goes to get ready for it. She just leaves the gun in there. As you heard from many witnesses, she would leave guns unattended all the time. There was nothing unusual about October 21st that caused her to be unable to stay in the church to properly perform her duties. She leaves the gun. She goes back out because for some reason, with the three hours of, uh, of free time that she had in the morning, she didn't get her fanny pack filled up. She didn't get herself ready for that turnaround, so she leaves the gun. Everybody's heard, armors don't leave the gun. Now, let's move over to our tampering with evidence charge. How is getting rid of a bag of cocaine tampering with evidence related to involuntary manslaughter? Well, on October 21st, 2021, the shooting occurs, the incident occurs. Um, Ms. Gutierrez understands that someone has been seriously injured. She does not yet know that that person is not going to live or has already died. She gets interviewed at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. I will say, surprisingly, Two occasions after this incident where a helicopter had to come in, ambulances had to come in, um, Ms. Gutierrez on two occasions after that incident spoke about her concerns about her career. Wow. That gives you an idea that you are dealing with someone who is not particularly concerned about the health and safety of others. And her job was to be concerned about the health and safety of others. But on that day, she's just thinking about herself. She's put a lady in the hospital, a man in the hospital. She asks to be escorted to the bathroom. Corporal Hancock agrees to do that. And we have her on video on the way there expressing dismay about how this will affect her career. Ouch. After the interview, Hannah goes back to her hotel. Rebecca Smith goes to Hannah's room. She's been summoned by some other folks to try to sort of sit and visit and give Hannah some support. So Rebecca Smith goes to her room and Rebecca Smith is the person that tells Hannah that Helena Hutchins has now died. And you have to understand, in the mind of Hannah Gutierrez, this investigation went from this big to this big. 
because the difference between shooting someone and them living and shooting someone and them dying is a really, really big difference. So she is told by Rebecca Smith, investigation just got giant and very, very serious. So after receiving that information, she offloads this bag of cocaine to Rebecca Smith. Rebecca Smith is a lady that's lived a life. She's used cocaine before, many years previous, but she's used cocaine. She knows what it looks like. She knows how it's packaged. And because she's a former addict, she tosses it in a trash can. When Mr. Bowles gets up here and says, I can't prove to you that it's cocaine, remember that when people destroy evidence to avoid prosecution, you don't have the evidence that they destroyed, they got rid of it. So I don't have to prove to you by some scientific uh, 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 drug test, I don't have to send that to the lab and get it tested. It's gone, that's the point to the charge. Now, let me, let me digress a little bit and, and run through a couple of things with you. What's all this testimony about this inertia puller? And how does that play into everything? Well, as you heard from Mr. Haig, an inertia puller is a device designed for one task. It disassembles live rounds. That's what it does. Somehow I think the defense got confused about what our potential theory was, that we had a theory that Ms. Gutierrez was turning dummy rounds into live rounds. That was never our theory, because that would require quite a bit of equipment. There's no question. But to do the reverse is a whole lot easier. So if you're out of dummy rounds or you're running low on dummy rounds and you've got some live rounds around, you could probably turn a dummy round, I'm sorry, you could turn a live round into a dummy round in five minutes. Why does an armor on a movie set bill for an inertia puller? Well, obviously she had one. Now, let's talk about the OSHA investigation. OSHA doesn't find any wrongdoing with individual employees, only employers, that's their job. They're just an agency that maintains workplace safety. Mr. Genoway confirmed when he was on the witness stand, it's true his memory was a little bad and Mr. Lewis had to refresh it for him, but he confirmed that Hannah's conduct on the set contributed to their findings that this was not a safe workplace. Please keep in mind that the OSHA investigation is not a criminal investigation. Critically and surprisingly, OSHA never interviewed Gabrielle Pickle. This is critically important because if, if they had interviewed her, they would have known the following things. Anna was granted 10 armor days out of the 12 filming days, not eight. That was right there in the cell phone records. The training days when Ms. Gutierrez is, is sending those messages saying, I want more training time, training days. She's not saying these actors, these adults need more training time. She specifically requested additional training time to train the child. And it was refused because first of all, it's a major liability issue. And second of all, the child was never going to fire a gun. So when she asked for the additional training days, they were denied. That's not the reason Helena Hutchins is dead. Keep in mind, Gabrielle Pickle uh, had a meeting 
with Hannah and offered her additional assistance so that she would be able to perform her duties effectively. She offered assistance uh, from some of the other folks there on set to try to give her some relief. And keep in mind that on a movie set, the armorer has autonomy with regard to gun safety. The, the, the OSHA finding that Rust Productions failed to properly supervise her is surprisingly incorrect because the armorer has no supervisor when it comes to weapons and gun safety on the movie set. Mr. Halls is just there to be a second pair of eyes. That's it. Now, I think there can be no question that Rust Productions was more than negligent when they hired Ms. Gutierrez because she was not anywhere close to being qualified for this job. In fact, if you recall, Gabrielle Pickle, to her credit, tried to get Ms. Gutierrez to implement a check-in and check-out system because two people had complained that there was a shotgun left unattended. People on the set were complaining about her. They went to production and said, hey, she's not supposed to do that. You can't just leave real guns laying around. So Gabrielle Pickle goes to Hannah Gutierrez, asks for a check-in, check-out system. Hannah Gutierrez says no. Hannah Gutierrez says it's too difficult, it's too much trouble. Gabrielle Pickle didn't prevent her from being safe. In that instance, she did the opposite. She tried to improve firearm safety on the set, but keep in mind, the armor has autonomy. So Gabrielle Pickle is not Hannah Gutierrez's boss when it comes to firearm safety. Ms. Gutierrez gets to do what she wants. Now I can only imagine that after this chain of cases, all of that will change. So the defense has taken a shotgun approach to this case. Seth Kinney is to blame. Well, no evidence of that. Sarah Zachary is to blame. No evidence of that. Dave Halls is to blame. He shouldn't have taken the gun from her. Um, and he didn't do a good safety check. Well, she is the autonomous decision maker with regard to gun safety. It's not that Dave Halls shouldn't have taken the gun from her. It's that she shouldn't have given him the gun and then turned around and walked away. Uh, the defense, Alec Baldwin is to blame for acting like a prima donna on the movie set and bossing people around. This is Hollywood, for heaven's sakes. I would imagine that's relatively common. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that his conduct was right. I am the person who indicted him. Alec Baldwin's conduct and his lack of gun safety inside that church on that day is something that he's gonna to have to answer for. Not with you and not today. That'll be with another jury on another day. Brian Norvell, the gentleman who goes and gets the prop cart and wheels it over and then puts his hand over the crime scene tape and picks up that dummy round and shakes it you heard Mr. Bowles ask some questions that, 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 that are intended to make people think that uh, Mr. Norvell either took something off the prop cart or planted something on the prop cart. Well, keep in mind, <coughs> he doesn't have to plant live rounds because we've seen from the photographic evidence, those are there, they're floating around already. Um, so live rounds were on set, they were not planted by, by Brian Norvell, but this man is not a mystery to the state or the defense. I made him come in and sit down for a one and a half hour interview. 
so that the defense could ask him any questions they wanted, and they asked him none. Not a single question. So what that means is that this is just all smoke and mirrors and deflection. They don't want the truth. We know the truth. You have seen it throughout this trial. And I will remind you that during one of the heated objection exchanges between myself and Mr. Bowles, you heard Mr. Bowles cry out that he was looking for the truth. Listen, I can bring a horse to water, but I cannot make him drink. If you want the truth, I'll bring the guy in. I'll make him available for you to talk to. Ask him some questions. Not a single one. It must have been that disgruntled camera crew. You mean the people who believed that safety on set was being compromised to such a degree that they left? That decision may very well have saved their lives. So the $60,000 question in this case, who brought the live rounds on set? You know the answer to that. I know the answer to that. I'm not telling you that Hannah Gutierrez intended to bring live rounds on set. I'm telling you that she was negligent. She was careless. She was thoughtless. She brought them on set, and you know from the testimony you heard, Sarah Zachary never saw her shake a dummy round. Dave Halls never saw her shake a dummy round. She didn't shake those dummy rounds. For all we know, those dummy rounds were floating around the set of the old way, and Nicolas Cage is lucky to have walked away with his life. So why does it matter that she brought live rounds on set? It goes to foreseeability. She had six, six live rounds on that movie set. The earliest date that I can track them for you is October 10th. We know that they were there from the 10th to the 21st. Six, and she failed to ferret them out for 12 days. What that means is that she wasn't shaking any dummy rounds. She wasn't testing anything. None of that stuff that her lawyers want you to think was so difficult. It was no, none of it was happening. It didn't happen the entire time. She didn't find any of them. And folks, if she's not checking the dummy ammunition during the pendency of the filming to make sure that those rounds that are designed to look like live rounds are in fact dummy rounds, this was a game of Russian roulette every time an actor had a gun with dummies. Sadly for Ms. Hutchins, her camera crew walked off set that morning and that required her to go into the church and operate the camera herself. And that's what she was doing when the live round that Ms. Gutierrez put in Mr. Baldwin's gun was expelled from that firearm and went all the way through her body. No one told Ms. Gutierrez to leave the church. No one called her out of the church. There wasn't a COVID protocol in place that prevented her from being in the church at that moment. You know from the production outfitter videos, she didn't care about her job. She let it all go. Mr. Bowles is going to argue to you that if, if Mr. Halls had just called Ms. Gutierrez back into the church, 
she would have done an additional safety check and that live round would have been found, well, for heaven's sakes. We all know that if she had been called back into the church for an additional safety check, nothing would have changed. Her safety checks didn't consist of pulling the dummy rounds out of the cylinder, shaking them in front of the actor and the assistant director, showing them that they're dummy rounds, and putting them back in. No one ever saw her do that one single time, even though that's industry standard. And the reason it's industry standard is because you can't tell a dummy round by simply spinning a cylinder and looking at the primers unless they are dummy rounds without primers. And that's kind of an interesting fact. We know that six dummy rounds without primers were not loaded into that weapon because one of them turned out to be live and very clearly had a primer. Interestingly though, she had five dummy rounds without primers in her pocket. In her pocket. All she had to do was put those in the gun, make sure that the sixth one either rattles or has a hole in it, and she's good to go. Because now, when you look, when the cylinder gets spun, you can see five of them without taking them out, that they don't have primers. They were in her pocket, and she didn't use them. Um, I am going to have another opportunity to speak with you, and when I speak with you uh, last, it won't be as long, I promise, um, and we will talk about some of our jury instructions then, but I do want to address some of the testimony from, the, from Dr. Gerald from OMI, uh, because Mr. Bowles is likely to make an argument that there was some sort of medical negligence. Uh, that contributed to Ms. Hul to, to Ms. Hutchins' death. And I want to talk to you a little bit about Dr. Gerald's testimony. Here are the lethal injuries. The lethal injuries. Blood loss from, from the wound. That was the primary lethal in injury. Her blood was leaking into her, in, into her abdominal cavity and a lot of it. And you saw those photographs, you saw the photographs of her clothing. There was a lot of blood. So the first lethal injury that comes from the gunshot it is blood loss associated with it. And the second one, if you recall from Dr. Gerald, uh, the, the wound to the, to the lung was also a lethal wound. Keep in mind, that bullet went into her body, it went through her rib, it severed her spinal cord, it punctured her lung, it came out the back of her shoulder, and a few hours later, Ms. Gutierrez is telling Corporal Hancock that she's worried about her career. If you think that person would have done a satisfactory safety check if she had been called back to the church, I am here to tell you that I strongly disagree. The astonishing lack of diligence with regard to gun safety is without question a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. Did Mr. Baldwin also contribute when he pointed the gun at people and pulled the hammer back and regardless of what he said to George Stephanopoulos, pulled the trigger? Yes, he is. And again, we'll deal with that another time. You don't escape accountability when you load a live round into a prop gun 
tell the crew that it has dummy rounds in it, hand it off to an actor and leave the room because he manipulated it? That's the whole point. That was the whole point to him having it. Of course he was going to manipulate it. It's foreseeable. Everything is so completely foreseeable. Imagine I hand you a gun and I tell you that it's basically empty and I walk away when in fact I put live ammunition in it. You think an accident might happen? You think that accident is foreseeable? And listen, let's remember some of the testimony from Mr. Carpenter. Control is how we enforce gun safety. We do it with control. When she loses control, which she did repeatedly, anything goes. Anything goes there. I am going to complete the majority of the portion of my closing arguments with regard to the facts. The next portion will be with regard to the law. When I come back after Mr. Bowles has had an opportunity to address you, uh, we will be asking for justice today for Helena Hutchins. Thank you. Now, may we approach? Well, it's about a bathroom break. We're going to take a bathroom break. Okay. Okay. So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Thank you. We'll be All back rise. at um, 10 of. Okay.